get started. So welcome everyone. I'm Zachary Singerman. I'm the founder and executive director of Gen Z Jews Fighting Anti-Semitism. I first wanna thank our event sponsor, Common Anti-Semitism Movement for their support and so much assistance with helping us create this event. And we could not have done it without them. So my story begins six months after my bar mitzvah. Until then, I was a normal Jewish kid. I attended day school. I had my bar mitzvah put I had my bar mitzvah and a dance party with my friends afterwards. That's what it meant for me to be Jewish. Then, on October 27th, 2018, a terrorist walked into my grandmother's synagogue, Tree of Life, in Pittsburgh, and he murdered 11 people. Her friend was murdered, another shot. Other friends, who are also grandparents, ran for their lives from the synagogue. At 13, I was a bar mitzvah, an adult in the Jewish world but I was not equipped as an American Jewish teen to react to what had happened. I started this organization, Gen Z Jews, so that my generation, including me, could be educated on the issue. Today, we are going to ha have a discussion with Gen Z leaders. But first, an introduction by Congressman Ted Deutsch of Florida. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman Ted Deutsch, and it is such a privilege to join this phenomenal group of young Jewish leaders. To Zach and all of Gen Z Jews, thanks for having me at your virtual summit. And thanks for your hard work raising awareness about the dangers of anti-Semitism. I've seen in my work, just as, as you've seen in yours, how painfully clear it is that anti-Semitic incidents are on the rise. We need to recognize that the problem of anti-Semitism has become more and more alarming and more urgent in recent years. This is reflected not only in the incidents that make the news, incidents like anti-Semitic flyers in Beverly Hills on the first night of Hanukkah, or the series of violent attacks against Jewish people and institutions back in the spring, but also from the data that we have. AJC's State of Anti-Semitism report for 2020 painted a clear picture. Over the last year, one in four American Jews has been the target of anti-Semitism in some form. 40% have made some behavioral change out of fear of anti-Semitic retaliation. 90% of American Jews see anti-Semitism as a problem in the United States today, as does over 60% of the general public. On the three-year anniversary of the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, I said, and I'll say it again, anti-Semitism is real, it is dangerous, and it poses a growing threat to not only the Jewish community, but to all of our communities around our country. But this is particularly true for your generation, for Gen Z. I spoke recently at GW where I heard from students firsthand about the anti-Semitism that they've experienced on campus. And just days after I spoke there, a fraternity on their campus was vandalized and a, a Torah scroll was desecrated. A Christian Bible was also in the room, but it was the Jewish holy text and that one alone that was destroyed and covered in laundry detergent. And we have data from the ADL and Hillel that are validating those lived experiences. They show that roughly a third of Jewish college students, your peers, have experienced anti-Semitism in the last year and 15% have felt the need to hide their identity out of fear. Multiple surveys over the last couple of years have also shown the Gen Zers are more likely than not to have seen Holocaust denial or Nazi symbols on social media. And many, if not most, like basic knowledge of what happened during the Holocaust. Now, some of you likely have your own experiences that reflect this trend. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I know you've heard it before. I say this because this is why the work that you all are doing is so critical. I'm proud of the work my colleagues and I have done on this issue, but combating anti-Semitism demands, demands far more than our efforts. It requires everyone, it requires Gen Zers to be active and engaged in the fight. It is efforts like yours that will change the story for young Americans, that will start creating campus environments that are more inclusive and empathetic, and that will shape a generation that is knowledgeable about anti-Semitism and its consequences. Uh, I'm the first to admit it. It can be frustrating when peers and colleagues and friends aren't aware of the history of the words that they choose and invoke harmful stereotypes without knowing the ramifications. As difficult and as frustrating as it might be, 
it is on all of us who have a history understanding and working on this issue to help people understand what anti-Semitism is, why those historic tropes can be so dangerous, and what it means to be an ally to the Jewish community. As a proud member of Congress, proud Jewish member of Congress, getting to speak with the next generation of Jewish leaders is among my favorite parts of this job. So keep up the excellent work. Thank you for all you do and best of luck in these efforts. And let me know how we can continue to do this work together. Thanks. So we wanna obviously thank the Congressman for making that video for us and speaking to us and really just for being a, a incredible help towards Gen Z Jews and being towards Gen Z and, and you know, America in general. So now we turn to our round table and today we are going to have a discussion with three members of Gen Z who are in both high school and college. And I want to preface this with leadership comes in many forms. First, now first they will give all of their experiences and then we'll head into a discussion. And then we were going to talk about some issues and eventually get into a Q&A later on. So I want to start off with Ariel Edberg. So first, Ariel is an 11th grader at the Field School in Washington, D.C. She is a proud member of Koach's BBG, a chapter in her Jewish youth group organization. She grew up in a conservative synagogue and attended Hebrew school from third grade through seventh grade. Ariel grew up visiting her great grandparents in New Jersey who were Holocaust survivors from Poland. Her summer of 2020 was spent making challahs every Shabbat and for Hanukkah, she asked for an IDF shirt. Now you can find Ariel wearing a Jewish star necklace as she continues to figure out what role Judaism will play in her adulthood. Ariel, can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to really get involved? Yeah, it definitely has to do with my great grandparents who are Holocaust survivors from Poland. I was really close with them before they passed away and listening to their stories of how little acts of anti-Semitism eventually built up to bigger acts and, and then the Holocaust and that whole tragedy. And I wanted to get involved to make sure that not only those things happen to me, but that they don't happen to my kids as well. So next, I want to introduce Carrie Tannenbaum. So she's also a junior in high school, and she's from New Jersey. And she has been on her school's No Place for Hate Committee for two years now. She is also involved in her school's theater department as the head of props and a member of the set design team. In her free time, she likes to write, read, and paint. In college, she hopes to study English and creative writing. When anti-Semitism occurred at her high school, she wrote and published a poem about how she felt which is now on the Gen Z Jews YouTube channel. Carrie demonstrates that leadership can come in all different forms. Carrie, can you tell us what happened at your high school and why you decided to write your poem? Yeah, so at my high school, there was multiple incidents of um, swastikas being found in our bathrooms. And the response I found at my school wasn't the um, best response that could have happened. I really like writing poetry. I find it really um, a soothing thing. And after this experience, I decided to put my emotions and write a poem about it. And hopefully that somewhere it would make a difference. And um, it did slightly. And finally, I wanna introduce Natty Cressman, who is our final participant. She is also in college and she is from Toronto, bringing in our international perspective. So at only 18, Natty Pressman has, has over four years of experience advocating for the Jewish community. Her maternal grandfather, a former refusenik and proud Israeli, greatly influenced her upbringing and ignited her passion for Jewish life. She is currently a member of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a member of My Story is Your Story project, a Jewish on campus ambassador and a Jewish awareness director at Queens University Hillel. In 2021, Natty completed a summer semester at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, studying the history of the Arab Israeli conflict. Currently, she is entering her sophomore year at Queens University in Kingston, Ontario, majoring in history and minoring in Jewish studies. 
Natty Pressman's advocacy has taken her to international conferences in Cartagena, in Cartagena Colombia, and New York City. Natty always emphasizes the importance of physical and mental well being when fighting anti Semitism. She hopes that sharing her experiences with, the Jewish, with Jewish advocacy and battling her anxiety dos disorder will encourage Gen Z to fight anti Semitism in a meaningful way for them and for them and non disruptive to their, to their physical and mental health. Natty, would you please tell us about your work with the Jewish, ad with Jewish ad advocacy and how to consider your mental health, which is extremely important for Gen Z, especially with COVID? Yeah, um, just wanna check, you can hear me, right? Okay, Yeah. perfect. Um, so my experience with Jewish advocacy is that it's always been something I'm very interested in. As I've mentioned previously, uh, the experiences of my family and anti-Semitism really ignited my passion for fighting um, anti-Semitism. And I've always had been the type of person who would be very into seeing like what's just in the world. And when I would see something and be like, this is the right thing to do, I'd be like, this has to be, it has to be this way. And I think that kind of translates into how I approach advocacy and how when I see something and I believe that Jewish people should feel comfortable in expressing their identity and Israeli students should not feel that they have to hide where they come from or where their parents are from in order to feel safe. And I feel like that's something that's an, that's the truth. And I feel that I want to go through any ways that I can to make sure that other people also acknowledge that. Um, in terms of mental health and physical well-being, is that I've met people who are excellent advocates, advocates for anti-Semitism. And there's a, seems to be um, a very concerning, you know, a concerning aspect of anti-Semitism is the fact that it is obviously very distressing for your mental and physical health. What this looks like is that there's a lot of advocates who push themselves to the extent, and I've been in this situation where I'm not prioritizing school as much as I should be, where I'm skipping meals because I'm freaking out and I'm so stressed out about a, um, a current incident happening at my school. And so finding that balance between fighting anti-Semitism, taking care of myself, is extremely important. And something, something that I always really like to remind myself is this concept in Judaism that emphasizes the importance of well being. And I think that the way in which people, Jews, can fight anti Semitism is that in whatever way that it makes them feel safe and comfortable within themselves. I think existing as a Jew is the resistance. And if you, know, if you don't feel comfortable writing a paragraph on Instagram, the fact that you exist is enough. Um, and I really emphasize how important it is to take care of yourself because being a healthy Jew and being a Jew that just exists is enough and you shouldn't have to push yourself through a lot of mental turmoil. Yeah, sorry. No, that was great. Um, can you also just tell us, for some of us who are still in high school, can you tell us kind of like if you face these types of pressures of it, like BDS with like comments and protests and just general anti-Semitism on college campuses and your thoughts on kind of how to be prepared to respond to these types of people. Yeah, um, so it's very interesting because it's the first time that I'm actually um, the oldest person in um, a room with other Jewish activists. So this is very interesting and new. Thing that I'm experiencing for the first time. So I just finished my first year of university. Um, and so my experience with anti-Semitism on campus is dependent on what my university went through. But because of the work I've been doing with an organization called Jewish on Campus, which started as an organization, um, I'm an ambassador for them. It started as an organization sharing anti-Semitic incidents on university campuses, and they now have an ambassador program, which I'm a part of where you basically represent a university that you attend as a Jewish student. And so you meet together and pass resolutions and you speak to Jewish students across North America about what their experience on campus is like. Um, so I can only speak for my own experience and how I deal with that, but I do wanna acknowledge the fact that I have listened to other um, students' stories. So 
my university experience is that I feel that in all universities and basically everywhere in the world, there is an underlying anti-Semitic bias that exists. And I think that can be further inflamed by the way in which people approach certain values that they seem to have. What I mean by this is that anti-Semitism itself was always positioned to be something that was supposed to be viewed as the morally right thing to do. And so as we can see, the, that's how anti-Semitism has kind of changed today. How we see how people view it as anti-Zionism and such. And a lot of the rhetoric used on campus um, is rhetoric that has existed for thousands of years against Jewish people. And that's something that needs to be acknowledged because that will exist in any single environment you go into. And it's difficult, it's hard. I think anti-Semitic bias is everywhere and how it perpetrates itself is dependent on the campus environment um, that you go to. I faced my own situations of personal online harassment, um, pretty, pretty, pretty rough ones, I'd say. I'm fortunate enough that I didn't take it too personally. Um, but I would say that like, sometimes at my school recently, the faculty association passed a motion against Ira. Um, and so the way that I dealt with that, despite it being really upsetting to see the fact that 69% of the faculty who attend your school are against a definition of anti-Semitism that Jews created for themselves, is just trying to stay as connected as you can with the Jewish community. My number one advice is try to find friends that understand what you're going through. Try to find other Jews, participate in Hillel. Um, because I think at the end of the day, the way in which Jewish communities are strengthened, the best way to sometimes fight anti-Semitism is when you feel safe enough to be with other Jews who understand what you're going through. Um, and so I think you have to prepare yourself that it can be pretty bad. It depends on the campus you're going to, but it can be very horrible. And, if, and sometimes you have to understand that it shouldn't be Jews' responsibility to fight anti-Semitism. And you have to make sure that you're doing it in a way that is safe for you. But number one advice, just stay with the community, find that community and find a group where you feel safe and trusted. So, now we're going to get into our more roundtable discussion. And to the audience members, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A and we 1000% will get to them later. So as you mentioned, Natty, there is the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, and that is slowly becoming the most, like the most widely accepted definition of anti-Semitism, both by Jews and by like actual like countries and governments. And so uh, the first question I wanna pose to everyone is just, how do you define anti-Semitism? Like in terms of the IRA definition, in terms of fighting for the IRA definition, maybe how it changes based on where you are, like at a high school or in like the real world. I think a general definition that I could give is um, just any kind of violent violence or um, like actions or words that pretty clearly express disdain for the Jewish people. I would say that's anti-Semitic. Um, that's a pretty like a uh, like not broad definition. Um, I think if we go into different situations, we can make more definitions out of that. But yeah. Um, well, I would say also, like, on high, in high schools, I don't, I go to a Jewish high school, so I don't know it as much, but I've heard places where kind of, you're not necessarily going to get as much, like, anti-Zionism activity just because people are a lot more misinformed, maybe even more than on college campuses. I don't know, Natty, you would probably know something about that. Um, but just like sometimes it's just kids being really stupid or they're influenced by their parents or the communities around them. And so how do you think kind of 
we can combat that sort of anti-Semitism just like within like teenagers' minds and kind of influence them? Um, so for the first question, I think that with any form of oppression, the way that that oppression should be defined is what the community that is being oppressed thinks what it looks like, right? So Jewish people should define anti-Semitism given the fact that IRA is recognized by, I think around 30 nations, uh, multiple governments across the world, provincial governments, including the government of Canada and my own provincial government. I think that should be the definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and so I operate out of that. Um, in terms of your second question, what can we do to combat anti-Semitism in high school? I think that, so what's very interesting is that I think there needs to be better Holocaust education um, on a wider range. In Canada, we are, so since we actually don't have hate against laws against hate speech in Canada, we're also uh, apparently planning to ban Holocaust denial, which is amazing. I think what's important though, is that the type of Holocaust education that is in Canada is vastly different than what you would get if you live in Toronto or if you live in rural Alberta. Um, and so I think first we need to have a wider range of Holocaust education that also emphasizes the distortion aspect of the Holocaust why is it wrong for people to not only deny the Holocaust in existence, but why is it wrong for people to say that it wasn't as bad? Or why is it wrong for people to compare it to current day events and use that to hurt Jewish people in the process? Um, other aspects I think is that people should be educated about Judaism and anti-Semitism in all shapes and forms. What it looked like before and after the Holocaust, what it looks like today, how are anti-Semitic stereotypes still occurring today? And I think that there becomes a point where you can't get people to care at some point because there are some people who are raised with parents. There are some people who are exposed to such negative content growing up. And those are some people that you may not be able to change. But I think you just need to think about the people that you can change. I think we need to focus on education at a young age and integrating that into curriculum. And Carrie, you also, you wrote your, poem which really talked about the anti-semitism in your school and so could you tell us a little bit about what the poem said and maybe other ways in which you think kids in your school or just teenagers in general can do similar things to what you did yeah um I mean the primary theme of my poem was it was kind of about the genocide that Jews had experienced you know in the holocaust and how they kind of like the, how people tried to warn against, you know, people warn about that the Holocaust could happen again, but it's like no one is listening that um, to Jewish people who are trying to inform people about this to make sure it will never happen again. And I mean, personally in my school, we have been trying to combat not just anti-Semitism, like everything, like we've tried to combat into Asian hate, racism, my school has been trying to. Um, I'm not sure if they've been doing the most um, efficient job at doing everything. We did actually have a Holocaust survivor come into our school um, like a month ago to talk about his experience. Um, and I do think things like that, they do help. I personally do believe. And I think in my school district, they are trying to start informing people from a younger age, starting from like elementary school um, and starting to have discussions with kids, which I agree is very important because I think you need to start conversations and start education from a younger age to actually implement and like get people to understand how serious. And also I will say though, I think Personally, for my school, a lot of people understand how horrible the Holocaust is. We've learned about it in classes. We, we all know, but it's almost like people can't understand that the Holocaust wasn't like 500 years ago. It was like over, it's not, it's a hundred, less than a hundred years ago. People are still alive who've gone through this and it's, and it's still current. Like there are still acts that are happening currently. And that's what I think schools need to really stress is that this is still happening like today in our society. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I've talked about that in the past, kind of how it, like to our parents or our grandparents, they at least like those of them who were Jewish knew a Holocaust survivor personally and were very close friends or family friends with them. And so the Holocaust was still very recent for them. But for our generation of Gen Z, to us, it feels so long ago because it just, we obviously don't have a memory of it that time. We, and we just can't comprehend something like that happening in what feels like a modern world to us. And so from your perspectives, what is really a Gen Z responsibility to get involved? I think Gen Z is all about helping minority groups and people who have been previously discriminated against. And um, I think that Gen Z as a whole should not forget about the Jewish people. I think we've considered so many different types of groups and that's amazing, but um, we need to do our part to make sure that we remind Gen Z of the Jewish people and make sure that we're also standing up for the Jewish people and you know making sure that what has happened in the past doesn't repeat. Um, and also while I'm talking, I wanted to add um, a point. Since I go to a secular school, I have a lot of friends that are not Jewish. Um, I remember last year having a pretty heated conversation about Israel and Zionism with my friends. Um, I think multiple times I've had this conversation where I would be advocating for Israel and, you know, trying to argue that side and my friends not really agreeing with me. Um, Even one of my friends not agreeing with me who was Jewish, um, which is always interesting. Um, It's just like, it's interesting to to get different perspectives. Obviously I respect everyone's perspective, um, but yeah, I, I don't think they make the connection of what Zionist, what Zionism like does to Jew, what anti-Zionism does to Jewish people. Or um, I, I think it's it's more of just morally, again, like as being anti-Semitic um, previously was thought as the morally right thing um, as Gen Z is standing up for um, all of the marginalized groups. We're also thinking about, um, you know, and this is obviously a very complicated, complicated um, situation, but Gen Z is also trying to decide, you know, should they be on the Palestinian side or the, or the Israeli side? Um, and I think it's important to consider both sides equally. Um, and I think it does start with education as the other speakers were saying that we need to educate about the Holocaust, but not so much about the past, not make it a history lesson, but really connect it to the present and the future. I think that I view this question in two forms. I think, firstly, I kind of viewed it in terms of, you know, Gen Z in general, and also people in general. And secondly, I also view it in this particularly interesting perspective on the obligation people have in countries where Jews were persecuted to um, not be involved in anti-Semitism, despite how many years ago that might've happened. So firstly, I think every single person in the world has an obligation to make the world a better place. And that sounds something that like a child might've wrote, but I think it's true. And even if it's not true, we should all act like it's true to make the world a better place. And I think in that process, we have to understand that the clarification of what makes the world better Um, needs to be made that it includes everyone, that it includes Jews, that it includes Israelis who have the right to exist, that it includes Jewish people to not be scared to wear a kippah or to wear a Star of David. Um, And as such, I think that we need to emphasize that. And I think people, especially Gen Z, who, um, as Ariel said, becoming so active in justice, which is absolutely amazing, need to include Jews in that because you can't fight white supremacy. You can't fight hatred if you don't include fighting for Jew- for Jews and you don't include advocating for them. And by advocating for them, I don't mean speaking over for them. I mean, listening to what they have to say. And secondly, 
what's very interesting is that what I've seen myself um, as all my family on my father's side still live in Germany, um, originally from Russian, uh, we're Russian Jewish, which former Soviet Union is where what most Jews in Germany presently, um, that's their background, but they live there now. And there's this rhetoric being used in Germany where in other places in Europe where Jews are prosecuted saying, well, I don't have an obligation to fight against anti-Semitism because that was my grandparents or I'm a new immigrant and I don't have an obligation. And the way I view that is that if you're on any piece of land where a Jew once lived, where a Jew was prosecuted, where a Jew was killed for being a Jew, even if your family does not come from that land specifically, even if you just immigrated, even if you just went to visit that country, you have an obligation to be respectful and you have an obligation to help fight anti-Semitism. And that's something that I think needs to be made more clear about the obligation to fight anti-Semitism is not just a generational one, but is one that everyone should have. Because I think in every country, Jews have been persecuted and Jews have faced discrimination. And as such, I think everyone has an obligation to listen to us when we say something is wrong. So as Nadia, as you put it greatly, Jews always have like an obligation to do something. And so sometimes you can like actually stand up for yourself just by being proud of your Jewishness. So how do you guys actually show pride in your Judaism? Um, for me, that's one of the biggest things that I do. That's the way I personally fight anti-Semitism. Um, I try to be like the biggest Jew at my high school. You know, I wear my Jewish star necklace. And whenever I'm not wearing that necklace, I'm usually wearing my high necklace. And if I'm not wearing any of those necklaces, I feel like I'm missing something. Um, so I try to do that and always speak up whenever, you know, Israel or Jewish people are being talked about amongst my peers. Um, I try to stand up and put in my perspective as someone who is Jewish, um, just so I, they can hear, you know, answers through someone who has actually lived the experience. Um, and yeah, and I also learn about Judaism at my school. There's um, a high, like a Holocaust and psychology class next year that I'm taking for history. Um, so just learning about it and sharing my experience and being proud of myself. I went through a phase this year where um, I wore tichels to school. I, I did it twice, um, even though I'm not a married woman. I don't really have to do that, but I just wanted to. So um, just things like that in, in what I wear and what I say, that's how I show pride and how I fight anti-Semitism. I know that personally, I always wear my like massive uh keepa i feel like it's that it like obviously it singles me out as a jew when i'm like taking the metro to or from school every morning or afternoon but me having it let's say if i run into another jew it shows like i'm out here i'm not hiding i'm showing that i really am proud of my jewishness i'm showing that i'm not afraid to be a jew and I feel like that's something that's really important nowadays because you see like Jewish fraternities get vandalized. You see Torahs get demolished and it's terrifying and disgusting. And so showing this pride in your Judaism is really a great thing, I feel. And I definitely... Oh, keep going. <laughs> no, you go, you go. I'm so sorry. No, I was going to call. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Okay, um, so I agree with everything that's being said, but I also think it's super important to add is that if you're in a situation where you feel that you have to hide your star of David for safety, if you're in a situation where you don't feel like you can wear your kippah, it's, a, it's not your fault. It's not your fault that you feel uncomfortable. And it's never a Jewish person's fault if they don't feel safe enough to wear or outwardly show their Judaism. And I say that on the perspective of the fact that in the, in the city where my grandparents live, last August, a Jewish teen 
wearing a kippah was beaten by 10 people because they were wearing a kippah. And I think that I'm so thankful that I feel comfortable in most situations to wear a Star of David and talk about being Israeli. But the fact that, you know, there are situations where I don't feel comfortable. And that's not a reflection on Jews. It's a reflection on the world around them. And I want to emphasize that if you ever feel that you're going to be physically unsafe or it's not your fault. Um, and wear Jewish pride to the extent that you feel that you can. And I think that it's wonderful if you do, but also if you don't and you don't feel safe, that will never be your fault. I think the way that I exercise Jewish pride is that, you know what, I'd love to say that I am all the time, I, I, I honestly all the time talk about being Jewish, but there has been situations where I do feel a little bit of anxiety to do that. And I always reflect on that's not my own fault, but that's the world around us. But I think even just saying that I'm excited for Hanukkah can be really helpful and being open to educating people about Judaism is a way to show Jewish pride because you're sharing it. Um, and I think that, I think that's wonderful that what you guys are all doing. Well, for me, I um, go to a Jewish camp, which is like a big a place where I think a lot of pride for Jewish. Um, it's like a really great community. I think having a community which it's just Jewish kids there, um, it's really like different and it really makes you appreciate, I think, like Judaism a lot more when you're with a community of teenagers who all understand everything that you're going through, who have similar interests as you. And like, it's just, I mean, I think it's really a great community. And I've been to like camps before that are not Jewish. And I like wholeheartedly admit that like a Jewish camp is in my opinion, a, just a lot better community and a lot more like fun to just be around people like you. So I wanted to move on to uh, the idea of like Marjorie Taylor Greene and kind of jokes about Judaism. Because obviously when Marjorie Taylor Greene said that Jews have space lasers, which does not make sense, um, we like the Jewish community just took it and kind of ran with it and like joked about it. Like, oh yeah, we have space lasers. Oh yeah, all these types of things. And like, just joking about it. And so first off, should we do that? And also Jews are, like in the Jewish community, Jews are in a joking way again, called the biggest anti-Semites. And so do you think that like this is okay for us to be joking about our people and our history in this way? Or should we really try to not be like that so that we can really spread the message about how anti-Semitism is in all these types of forms? I think you only have the right to joke about things that you experience. Um, so I think with, there's also, so the Marjorie Taylor Greene thing, I think that there's a way to make things humorous in a way that shows how ridiculous she was being when she said that. And I also think that's the way to do it, where you use humor in a way to showcase how ridiculous and anti-Semitic and anti-Semitic comments is being. But you also have to be aware that when you are making those jokes, there could be people who don't know that you're joking. And so I think it's important to make sure that you disclose that it is a joke and at least like maybe reply to a funny tweet with like some resources. Um, and so I think that's very important. Um, I was gonna say something else, okay. I think it's also just important to add that Jewish people deal with a lot of their trauma through jokes. Like that's why we're so funny. Um, but also it's like how we deal with like all this trauma is through humor sometimes. And so I think that's something that we need to acknowledge, but we also have to do it in a way that is appropriate. And we understand that we have limits because I can make a joke about something that I might've experienced with someone who is, you know, when it's not that big of a deal. And there's someone who would know that I'm joking, but I shouldn't be making jokes about something that I did not experience as a Jew with someone who might think I would be serious. Um, yeah.
Yeah, I was someone who has a lot of non-Jewish friends at school. Um, I know in the past that I've definitely joked around with them about um, just different jokes. And I think um, what Marjorie Taylor Greene said, I think, again, like making jokes is a coping mechanism. I think that's really important to recognize first. And then we need to figure out where the line is of where it doesn't become a joke. And um, as Nadi was saying, there's there's like people who aren't very educated about the Jewish people and what it means to be Jewish and their history, they can take it as, as you're being serious and it's not a joke. And I think, especially online, making jokes online where pretty much anyone can see your comment, it's important to make sure that you disclose that what you're saying is a joke. Um, but I think it's okay with friends. My personal opinion is that, I don't know, the more that we, I feel like jokes can sort of bring people together in a way. If you joke around, joke about everyone's differences in a pretty weird way, it kind of brings you together. It makes you feel like you're all different. You all come from different cultures and different histories. And that's something that you share. You share the fact that you're all different. Um, and you can, I think you can feel that by making jokes, but obviously there definitely is a limit. Um, so as a community, we just need to find that limit and make sure we don't cross it. Um, and especially be careful online. Um, Um, so now moving into our audience questions. Um, so Holocaust education is really important, but so is highlighting Jewish contributions to society. And that's really missing in every facet of society, except within Jewish communities themselves. So do you notice how Jewish American Heritage Month is like totally ignored and what we can really do about that? Wow, to be honest, I didn't even know that was a thing until right now. I know. Which is it's really, really upsetting. It's this month, I'm pretty sure. And month, okay. I haven't heard a thing about it. I mean, me and my friend, um, we kind of joked about it because this week, this month is also Asian American Heritage Month, and no one really knows about that either. So we were like, wow, no one knows that this month is like for heritage. And just the fact that like two important communities share like the same month, like it's just, I don't know. I mean, that question's a little, what can we do? I think we, it, the most important thing is just to educate people. I really, that's like cliche, but just really educate people and really try and get the message out. Um, especially since this month is like Jewish heritage month. Um, we really need to like educate people on everything they can do to help. Like I know that a lot of my friends are like they're helpful and understanding but at the same time I don't think they fully understand the perspective of what it is coming from like a Jewish teenager so really just making sure that everyone is educated and understands what we're going through I think that's the most important thing um to be able to just help people understand so another question from the audience how do you find bravery in what you do and how do you find bravery to actually speak up? I get really angry. Like I feel like a lot of my bravery is just like me speaking up is because I get so angry when I see anything anti-Semitic and I also get really sad. Um, there was an incident at my school and someone messaged me saying, you were so calm and composed when you wrote those, when I wrote a few statements for the Jewish sorority I'm part of. And I almost like laughed because I was absolutely not composed. I was so angry. And so I think that a lot of the bravery that I had is because I'm so passionate that I don't even think, like it's intuitive. Like it, I get so angry. I feel like I just, you know, I have to always, sit back and be like, how do I address this in a way that is 
effective and actually helpful because sometimes yelling nonstop does absolutely nothing. But I think the reason why I speak out is because I just get so passionate about it. And also the fact that I think about the stories my grandfather told me about him and the KGB trying to hunt him down. And I think about the fact that if he could do that, I feel like I can do what I can um, to honor him. So just as anti-Semitism slowly increases and increases, and actually not even slowly anymore, it's rising at a drastic and scary rate, how do we balance the positive of being Jewish with the negative of increased anti-Semitism? And how does that really play out for Gen Z Jews who do not identify as strongly as being Jewish or outwardly Jewish? I mean, I can speak for the way in which um, anti-Semitism is reported in terms of other diaspora, uh, diaspora Jewish communities besides North America. What I've seen myself is that I feel that a lot of Jewish news outlets that are primarily based um, in the US and in Canada often only share things about European Jewish communities or Latin American Jewish communities when something anti-Semitic happens. And that's, you know, if you search up on a Jewish news website, if I search up Germany, all I see is all the anti-Semitic stuff that happens, which is so important to share. But also I think that there needs to be more of an effort sharing all the positive things that happen there. Um, for example, in Germany, they have a singing contest called Jurovision, which is a singing contest of Jewish uh, students across the country and they all meet up and they all have a singing contest and everyone loves it. And no one shares all those positive stuff. No one shares about how there's a community that despite being small is so closely knit and so beautiful. And I think that there's, that needs to be done. I think we need to share anti-Semitic incidents, but I think we should also emphasize the beauty in these communities in their own way. Um, oh, you go. Oh, sorry. Um, I was gonna say, I think that another important thing that we can do is outreach work um, to people that we know that aren't Jewish, really welcome them into our community. I, I feel like Jewish people have, I've thought of this like very right before the webinar, but Jewish people have been, you know, persecuted throughout history. I think in some way we have built trust issues with other groups of people and we need to not like kind of not do that anymore. We need to be really be more inviting to them and help them help us by, you know, sharing our culture, inviting them to Shabbat or Hanukkah, really like sharing who we are. And that's also education for them, learning about what we do, what, what our values are. Um, I think we also, yeah, we need to ask for help, um, really reach out to non-Jewish communities. Um, and just uh, as another one of our audience questions, how do you really, I can't really speak to this one, but how do you not tokenize yourself as like the, the singular Jew in a non-Jewish community while also speaking up for the Jewish community and relevant topics? And also I think um, just Carrie and Ariel, like in, especially in high school where like people can become very divided and also in college, I guess. Nah. Um, in my school, it, it is a secular school, but there is a good amount of Jewish people. So, um, because of that, I never, a lot of people, a lot of Jews tend to, you know, make comments when, like, stand up for the Jewish people. So I don't usually feel like the token Jew in those communities, but as someone who is probably one of the most religious Jews at my school, um, I... I do have that perspective and um, I think maybe I do sometimes 
I guess I, I think I might try to come off as the token Jew just because I want to share my experiences and educate, um, which is probably something that I should work on. But yeah. I mean, for me as well, my school has, I mean, it's still a minority population, but there are a good amount of Jewish students at my school. And I do have a lot of Jewish friends. Um, not many of them are like also very religious. Like I have a couple who attend Hebrew school often, but I would say most of my Jewish friends aren't too religious. So it's just like, even though it's still like a small community, it's still like good to stick with one another when especially like scary anti-Semitic accidents happen, not accidents, but incidents. Um, and it's just like good to have people to lean on, even if they're not super religious, um, we still can understand each other and we still do fear in those situations. I mean, for me, I always kind of, I try to do things collectively and I also try to get the opinions of other Jewish students on my campus and I try to work um, with students on my campus, I work with Jewish students who are part of my Hillel. Um, I try to do collaborations. I try to work collectively as much as I can in terms of advocacy. But if it's just me in a situation, I always make it clear that I'm just one person. Um, my opinions are myself. And I think that that perspective, and I think people need to be more clear about that. Because I think Jews, regardless of their opinions on Zionism, need to begin being more clear that their opinions are reflections of themselves, unless there is a collective group um, advocating for that. And that collective group itself, if it's a minority in numbers, for example, Jewish Voice for Peace doesn't collectively speak for all Jews. Um, and I think there needs to be more acknowledgement of that. And I hope to continue that. So first off, um, I wanna, end this with a call to action to everyone who's watching and everyone who will watch in the future. So we hope that tonight has inspired you and really made you want to take a lead in the fight against anti-Semitism. We want to hear your voice, whether it's writing an op-ed or something more creative, like a poem. And you could organize an event or join a group where you find similar or even or different minded people. We urge you to reach out to your congressional or parliament representative and let them know that you will not tolerate anti-Semitism because we need to take a stand today and taking a stand is what counts if we wanna have any sort of hope for the future. So I also wanna thank Carrie, Ariel, and Natty so much for coming on here tonight and speaking and sharing their experiences and thoughts. And I want to thank all of you for watching as well, and those who are watching in the future once more. And finally, I want to thank the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, and make sure to follow Gen Z Jews and CAM, or Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, um, on social media, and CAM's TikTok now as well. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channels, where you will find recordings of and other interviews and so much more wells and knowledge wealths of knowledge <laughs> but thank you so much everyone for being here tonight it was great having you bye thank you zach for organizing this as well